So it feels like super. It. I'm so happy to see you guys. You too. Um, but it feels so off to be smiling at you guys as we're about to discuss um, incidents in a life of a um, slave girl, right? Like it feels weird to even have a um, pleasant, you know, demeanor when entering into this book. Um, so I think that since we're going to be doing this conversation in a way that some other folks are going to see us out, you know, we'll introduce ourselves. I'm Sherlanya and somebody else can go. <laughs> I am Jacob. And I'm Cheyenne. All right. So let's get into it. So I think that my first question that I have for you guys is, um, our maybe first questions are. So like you have some choices about how you go about this. And I knew that we were gonna have a real small group. So you guys, if you have stuff that you're like, listen, we need to discuss the following. Let's do that. Don't feel like, um, don't you know, knock me off of the um, GPS and take over at any point, okay? But um, I guess that my questions are, is this the first time that you read this book? Um, and what, what's your experience in reading slave narratives? Um, so <laughs> it's always so hard on zoom yeah. um i believe this is like my third or fourth time reading this book i wow. read it quite a few times in high school and then in my undergrad as well and it Where never stopped school? i'm curious yeah oh i went to high school i lived in ohio in south euclid so i went to charles f brush high school um i'm sure there's a a nice chunk of people who live in the Ann Arbor area who also went to that high school. <laughs> we all like to move over. And it's just as maddening kind of to read now in terms of just, it's something you never truly like read and then you say like, okay, I understand how this happened and why it happened. And even at the end, I'm still upset and I know that's the point of this narrative and the point of a lot of slave narratives, which I have a push and pull with in terms of reading, um, just because if that's the only representation you get, it's frustrating to just see yourself struggle <laughs> over and over again, but very complex feelings, I would say, with this. Thank you. There's definitely, I, I, I felt as though when I was reading it, I came to a point where I had to say, uh, I was so consumed by the horrors and like literal horrors. Um, uh, reading it, I was like, this reminds, I'm a big horror movie fan. And I, I was like, this is worse than anything I've ever seen in any horror movie. As somebody who's read Slave Narratives before, it just never, uh, I came to a point reading this where I had to say, okay, reckon with how awful this is but I also need to see what the author is saying rather than just reading it for all these awful things. Um, so I had read this initially in college. Um, and I think my, what was so different this time reading it for me was this is, this is like a, this is like a feminist book. I was, I was like, wow, this is like radically feminist. Um, so that was kind of, one of the many things I felt upon this experience reading the book. Okay, and I feel like um, I feel like it would be unfair to ask you guys that question and just be like, "Not gonna answer it myself." <laughs> That'd be a little rude. Um, I am, and I hate reading slave narratives. Like I've read some for academic work. I cannot. I I do not like to read them. I don't think that, I, I don't think that most people like, like to read them. Cheyenne, I'm cu curious about your push and pull. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to unpack that, but I, I would like, those are the kind of things where it's like, I'm skimming this cause I got to get this done, but I don't, I don't, I, I really have a hard time with it. I also have a hard time with, like, I don't like if I don't have a hard time reading about it, but like that first person narrative is very, very hard. Um, and I just don't, I just don't like it. I don't like to see, um, like, I know, you know, like, I know that, like, I am a descendant of somebody who had some kind of experience that involved, um, 
involve that. And it's very, I hate it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know that I only exist because this institution existed, right? You know what I mean? It's just like, there's this tension to me when I read this stuff, it's like everything good that you have in your life, you have because these terrible things happened to these people who came before you. And it's very uncomfortable. I'm also a person who feels uncomfortable watching any of the, like all of the black people we see being slain. I refuse to watch it. I don't need to see that. I don't want to see that. Um, I, I have no problem, um, you know, addressing the reality, but like, I, I don't want to walk around with those images in my head and then turn around and look at the black people in my house and be like, are, are you next? Right? Like, I just have the same kind of um, avoidance to this viscerally violent material. And so like, this was a different experience. And then it's like, all right, you're going to read every word of one of them and you're going to read it deeply in a way to be prepared to discuss it. Cheyenne, tell me about your push and pull. I'm so curious. Yeah. It's very similar and it's such a hard feeling, I feel like to describe because I am, I love history and I like these stories are needed and important. I just struggle with the same thing you said that like fatigue of having to put myself there and having to imagine my fam, my like ancestors as well, who went through this exact thing, if not worse. And with slave narratives too, I often, like I said earlier, if that's the only thing you're seeing, that's who you are. You are in, an, in that context, a slave, because that's the only representation of yourself that you have. And I have this like thing with slave narratives where a lot of them are, a lot of the more popular ones are written from the perspective of people who were slaves, but also had um, chances to write this story. So I can't help while I'm reading this, I can't help but think about, well, the slaves on the plantation who weren't mixed race, who had darker skin, who could not write about their stories. There's just so many lost voices and you start to get into that black hole of like, this is who I am. And this is like my historical mark is being beaten. And it's just, it's a hard push and pull because I, I personally, can't, it's hard for me to get into it, but there is such a value in the story, but I just have to wonder at what point, like, what's the value of constantly re-traumatizing Black people over and over and over again when this is like, like I said in my high school, we read this book and we also read, I believe, Native Son as well. But it's like, I would love to read a story where the main character looks like me and I'm not, you know, going through some big serious life altering event because everybody else in the class gets like what Swiss family Johnson or whatever. Well, and I have to kill a mockingbird. Yeah, you get to kill a mockingbird, which is like one of those books that's like, oh well that made me feel bad. If you're not the black person being prosecuted, it's like everybody else gets or I can't even say everybody else the white children get books where they get to feel guilty about the oppression that ancestors have committed. Whereas, you know, we have to get books where we have to actively face what happened to us and be traumatized in a setting where sometimes we can't even speak out about it. So I feel like that was a very long winded way of saying it's confusing. And for me personally, it's just, I'm at a point where it's not unnecessary in the slightest, but it's not the, um, framework that I want to engage in the world in. Sure. One of the things that you made me think about with that is just the way that I think about um, the way that I thought about slavery, like as a younger person, right? Like when you're in school, you like school will touch on it usually as a part of like this progress narrative, right? Like this thing happened, it was bad. There were slaves, you know what I mean? And then like you, as a part of the progress narrative, it's like, okay, slavery is bad. But what comes with that, I think sometimes it's like, and the slaves were bad, right? Or like you hear um, like some of these ideas uh, like, oh, well, some, you know, like when people feel guilty, it's like, well, not ever, not, it wasn't all terrible. Like you just hear all the stuff, which then like, as you're saying, as someone who um, 
like, oh, that's, that's the silo that you're in. Like, I think that there can be um, a sense of shame that comes with, um, comes with that experience. And like recently, like more recently, like in terms of like last few years, right? Like when I think about slavery and then the survival of black people, yeah, I think that one of the things that made me think about it too is like a lot of the um, guilt that you watch people experience, right? Like when there are conversations about like racism and and things like that um, and the way that that manifests itself. And it just made me feel like, wait a minute, like when you, when you locate yourself, like for, you know, my thinking, like when you locate yourself inside of these stories, like you then come from this line of like scrappy survivors, right? Or like the, this line of, um, this line of people who had to be extremely clever to like live, you know what I mean? And, and I think that, um, yeah, one of the things that for me right now, because of all of these discussions, I feel like these books are talking to each other in my head and 1619 keeps coming over and over and over and over again. And I feel like um, within that context and reading this narrative, especially as a narrative avoider, all I could see was like the ingenuity in these people, you know, in the enslaved people in the community um, that, that was around Jacobs because like that stuff doesn't happen accidentally right? Like where people are like buying themselves or like just figuring out the scrappiness, even though like, as you alluded to, she had like all kinds of um, color privilege, you know, and like lineage privilege that most people wouldn't have had. And that was like very present um, in the book to me, but you just really made me think about like what that experience is of like being located as that, as that person. Like my people are like from Louisiana. Like I'm not, I'm not, you know, like you have certain like units in history. Like I'm not one of the great migration blacks, right? Like I don't get to be a part of that, pro that, that leap forward. You know what I mean? I'm like a deep South black person who is like, okay, yeah. When they're talking about like this, this stuff, like that's, that's absolutely where your people were. You know what I mean? I can't see people's faces very clearly. Jacob, I feel like I feel like I like cut you off from saying something a little bit earlier. Not at all. No. So what does it mean to read a slave narrative in 2020? Uh, one why, of my first why, reactions. Why do you think that I put slave narratives on this list? Like I only put two, but why do you think I put them on there? When I was reading this, I thought to myself, you need to get this in the hands of my grandparents and my uncles and aunts because it, it, uh, white people, we sure are quick to diminish or not even recognize the legacy of what, 350 years, 400, 400 years of slavery in, the, in America. I think that um, a lot of, I see it in my family members and other white people, there's a, a, uh, uh, an eagerness to skim over that. And I want to be like, no, you got to read it and see this is what happened. And you need to keep that close to your heart. Because I think another purpose of reading these narratives is we need to see what parts of this narrative are still happening in America today. And you have to consider the ways in which Harriet's world is not all that different or the ways in which it is similar to our world today, even what, 200 years later. So those are some reasons why... I, I, I hypothesized why they were included on the list. I'm just trying to make sure I'm not like cutting people off. I'm so bad at like. Nope, done. <laughs> and I, I feel like Cheyenne, your body language was like, yep, not saying anything on this one. <laughs> well, I, I feel like for me personally, when I read these slave narratives, especially right now, it just really illustrates America's history of like, picking, choosing respectable revolutions. Like, I think about the parallels now to like, oh, well, if you want this type of justice, you have to do it this way, this way, and this way, but you can't do it this way, that way, and that way, or else you're bad and you're a criminal. But if you do it the way I think you should do it, then, you know, that's great, which the way they think you should do it is typically being quiet and not doing anything. And I like reading through and reading even her um, plea to like, 
you when she got into her relationship with Mr. Stans and she's like, you don't understand yes. like why I you would never understand why I did this. And I know it might seem unacceptable at the time for a feminist narrative, but like this is something I have to do. This is something I have to do to free myself personally. You wouldn't understand it. And it just the parallels of it just like very telling of how stagnant things can be sometimes, not all the time, sometimes. The, the parts in which the book where she breaks the fourth wall, if you will, and she's like, white women, please listen to me and understand me. And others, she calls upon all white people. She calls upon the, she, she summons the entire nation to reckon with what she is saying. Um, that was, what I'm trying to say is that the way that she wrote this narrative in itself is timeless because she she directly asked people deal with this or try to understand this and she even sometimes inform us informs us like you had said Cheyenne you can't even fathom this decision that I had made and I think that that um forcing empathy or willing empathy onto unwilling people um the book does a wonderful job of that as well Yes. Oh, there's so many places to go from here. Um, so one, like, I want to go, I want to go visit Mr. Sands for a moment. Um, but one of the things that was interesting um, in that moment where that you're talking about Cheyenne, where she's like, okay, so you wouldn't understand this, but this was a thing that I had to do. Like, that was the moment where I was like, oh yeah, right. I'm not the audience for this book. Um, northern white women are the audience for this book because when i read that i was like you got to do what you gotta do you know what yeah. i mean like i felt like no judgment at all you know and part of that is like you know it's 2020 you know people um handle themselves differently than like you know respectable womanhood respectable white women respectable middle to upper class white womanhood at that time would require but like when I read that I was like you gotta do something like I'm rooting for you do what you can grab that man and ride him on out of there if you can you know what I mean but then I was like you're you're in a different time and like you were never the audience for for this um for this book at all um but the other thing like to go back to something that you said jacob is um referring to it as like breaking the breaking the fourth wall i was surprised in reading this narrative to one be like oh i like this lady you know what i mean like i wasn't um you know, and so like, for me, I'm glad that I read this, like, even though I hate reading like these kind of things, I was like, wait a minute. One of the things that you got out of this that you would not have gotten through these other things is like a slice of her humanity in a different way um, that you that you would not have gotten it. Like, I, you know, I don't have any problem thinking of these folks who were um, enslaved as humans. That's why I don't like to read about their suffering, right? Cause like, I see them as like, like, ancestors and people like I don't want to watch anybody um suffer but like she was funny I was like that it like there were parts in this book where I was like that's that is hilarious like you know like when the slave catchers and the snakes come out right like and I'm sure that that is something um that was like a colloquialism at the, like it just feels like that's something that was said but I was like huh I never expected that I was going to find any humor among this horror but I think that that's an important thing, right? Because like when we don't acknowledge like people falling in love and people having petty conflicts and people like having humor, that is to ignore like the full humanity of a person. And that is to make somebody, um, you know, just a sum total of their suffering, which is not fair to um, do to anybody. And it wasn't until I was like, like she's funny that I was like, yeah, this is a level of humanity that you, you have not given these people. Um, in the past. Seven years in that little terrible underground um, place, seven years, I cannot even fathom that. But then 
like the other part of me is like, why aren't we re- why aren't we reading this in parallel with like the story of Anne Frank, right? Because like those are like why there's some parallels that I think would be useful in like I don't know thinking about commonalities that I think would be useful to think about right like I don't know but see you you Cheyenne you experience this as a part of like um uh primary curriculum right I had, I did not experience this as a part of primary curriculum and maybe that experience because it was like well we we heard about Am you know like you spend so much time hearing about Anne Frank's family and their um hiding and then like this chick is in here for seven years aching for the family that she can hear and that feels like something we should know about yeah i will say even with high school we didn't even really get into that it was really kind of like uh read this slavery set didn't it okay let's go read like lord of the flies that was kind of the like um surface level attention to it so I do think um every reread I've done has kind of revealed more and more to me of like the person that's behind the narrative I could not imagine that type of like torment even though I'm like I am black I understand this what's going on I have ancestors I like can't even put myself in that headspace to know that your family's like right there and you can't go out. And even when you do go out, this man is always going to be there, always following you, tracking you down. It's a lot, but I do think like you said as well, there is a lot of humanity and wit in this story that I do think may be lost on a first read or even maybe lost from the sense of just reading it as a slave narrative instead of like a biography of someone's life. It's, yeah, I didn't know how to finish that sentence, but those are the thoughts that are coming together. And what you said makes me think of that one chapter where it's just like, I'm gonna take a break from telling you the story of my life and I'm just gonna read the church down to the ground and I'm going to the way that she skillfully like she takes down so many cultural institutions throughout the book she's like white women I got your number she's like religion I have your number she's like sexual abuse I have your number um so that's really astounding but okay so from what you were talking what y'all were talking about like um how this would be a formative experience or, or perhaps not if you read this in high school, sent me back to me being a high school educator and thinking about how we read the books, how we choose the books. And I think really why a lot of um, American stories concerning blackness are not read in high schools is because it's it's self-incriminating. Um, we read Anne Frank because we can go, those Nazis were bad people. And, you know, she had such a good heart and that's beautiful. The, the establishment, if, if we were to read this book, the establishment would have to reckon with the fact that white people, the majority, those who are in power, are the villain and continue to be and um, use even use the same old tricks 200 years later. So... Th- nobody's jumping at the bit to get this in the hands of children and I, that's a shame is what i'm trying to say yeah i mean like i think it would have been a hard thing to read in a class context too also depending on like the makeup of the class like i would not want like i would not, i would not wish it upon any young black student who's like one alone in a class to even have to like crack this book in that context right because like context does matter too you know what I mean like 
because you know this is your first time encountering uh the as you know as you describe them horrors like people are gonna have to you, like uh, you need some emotional space to grapple with that no matter what right and if you feel like if you if you feel like hey this is your silo <laughs> right? Like you're going to need to, you're going to need to respond to that. Like no, nobody is going to be able to be like, okay, that feel this feels great. Like nobody is going to feel great doing that. And then like, what would that look like in that mm-hmm. kind of context is a question, but seven years is a long time. I just, well, I, I cannot even think about that, you know? Um, I would like to talk about her. Um, I would like to talk about her talking directly to white women in this book because, you know, again, as a modern reader, um, you know, this was interesting to me because she, like, I understand, I understand what she was trying to do. You know, like it's part of um, abolitionists uh, trying to, you know, um, part of that movement, right, where it's like trying to like win over people's sympathies and try to like move an issue you know she was like um you know dealing in that world but it was fascinating to me for her the point of view where you're saying like northern white women if you could only see these things you would be against this but she's like describing this world where other white women are super complicit and like violent in the system as well. So it's just interesting to um, think about that. And what I was thinking about within the context of that is like, you know, this narrative that we learn in school, right? Like the South was bad, the North was good. Like, where did that, like th- these felt like seeds for that, right? Like some of this felt like like seeds for that. Like, you know what, you Northern white women, I think you guys might be okay right? Like you guys could be the heroes in this story, right? Um, Though she doesn't let anybody off the hook all the way anyway, because she was like, yeah, like y'all are hunting people up here. You know, like you guys are participating in this system. I am being hunted in the free state of New York, right? And so like, I don't think that she's letting people off the hook either, but like she is allowing this doorway, right? Like if you want to feel like you're this good person, she's like, yes, you come through this door and help us with this work, which is very interesting to look at, right? Uh, as like a reader in our time. Yes, in, in a way she's ingratiating the white Northern readers, women readers and saying, I know you guys are gonna get this when I say this. And that's why I'm telling you guys. And then there's a whole nother conversation of like, these are all the ways that white Northern women don't get it. So she, she's she's like holding up a mirror and, and, and using persuasion tactics to, to, to get into their to get into their mind, right? Like, I know you guys are gonna understand this. And if you don't, you will eventually because you you have the capacity to listen to my story. And then there's all these other scenes in, in which Northern white women do not listen to her story. So it's like, she doesn't let, like you were saying, she doesn't let, anyone off the hook per se, but I think it speaks to more of, of, of how the book exists as a uh, piece of persuasion. And also, you know, um, I think it speaks to the way that she knows who she's talking to, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? I her, like her sophistication or to go back to, you know, um, like James Baldwin's idea, like, like I've had to look at you, I know you, you're the one who doesn't know me, I know you, right? And when she's like using this language where she's like, all right, so this is what you need to hear. She's demonstrating her mastery and her understanding, right? Of like these other people and how to, um, yeah, and how to move them, right? Because she under- she understands what they're thinking, right? Or she understands at least, like if you don't understand the thing that somebody's thinking, you can absolutely understand like the consequences of their actions or like what it is that they're gonna do. Like a lot of times I, I'm like, I don't ever know what somebody's thinking, but I am able to predict what they're gonna do. You know what I mean? And I feel like you're seeing her do quite a bit of that. Um, so I feel like if you're gonna talk about this book at all, you kind of have to talk about like motherhood and let me tell you guys, it is depressing to be listening to an audio 
version of this book while you are literally nursing your infant like that just does not feel it just feels like I hope you can't taste this can you <laughs> like it just felt weird especially um especially like when we see the story of the woman who stopped nursing her own baby in order to provide enough nourishment for you know the family she was obligated to and that's a thing like you know that it happened but again like this first person story right when it's just like at three months you know three months your baby doesn't even get to have your milk anymore because like this other baby gets to have it like what like it just really shows like how every corner of life is touched by these things you know i don't i don't i don't know where i was going with that i didn't leave any space for anybody to pick up that ball <laughs> sorry <laughs> no in just to maybe mirror what you were saying when i was reading the part where she was like praying for her child to die and then the next sentence she's praying for her child to live it's like, I will never be able to conceive of what that feels like or could feel like. I simply need to be in awe of, of the capacity of a mother to love their child so much that the absence of life, it, it might be the best way for them to show their love. I was like, man, I, the world's messed up and sad and like, I just wanted to highlight that particular part because um, I just found it to be, uh, it, it was a, it was a reality check for me. There was so much of that too, you know, so much of like the, um, like prayers to like die or like prayers for like the relief of your loved ones. Uh, there, that was definitely a recurring theme that really stacks up on you as you continue to um, read the story, that's ultimately like this scrappy survival story too. You know, it's just, just that, that pull is very interesting. Um, so one of the things that this book made me think a lot about that I, uh, like, I don't even wanna say like, I wanna think more about this cause I kinda don't, but I feel like I do cause I was a peaked by this a little bit, but just like the, um, just the way that, you know, slavery and sexual abuse and sexual jealousy and how that all balls up in a knot, right? Um, because you've got um, the doctor who's like chasing this woman, I'm sorry, this girl, then woman, for a while and he's like he's like I own you I own you and you will never escape me right and so like there's this power sex overlap there then the wife goes through some things where she's like wait where she has like this moment where she's got to like reckon with what's going on but then she's like so angry at the woman which is how these things happen like there's so many situations like in other situations where like a man does something wrong and the women are mad at each other you know and so like that felt very like normal that part of it but mm -hmm. just the way that that all is balled up is very interesting and I felt like she painted that very effectively and did i under did i read it right that when she had um the child by the man who was not who was not her master the wife re was so disgusted that she would have a child with some other man that she said if this woman comes back in my house i will kill her i but see the wife was just so the wife, I feel like, wanted any excuse to, like, have that energy towards yeah. her. 
but then like the what but i don't know there's just a lot going on right because like you know she embarrassed you know harriet embarrassed her husband right so like there's that you know because like that social standing is going to be a thing you know and then they're like all these unwritten you know rules that was the other thing that was soup that i was not expecting to get here right it's just like oh well you know it's totally fine if this guy's got all these like brown children running around but you don't want to let your friends see that those children have your face you can sell them but don't buy them because if you buy them to free them that's a problem because people will get the wrong idea and like people, you know, be harder to contain all just the way that all these rules were, it's like not surprising, but it's also like shocking to Mm -hmm. like, like sentence by sentence, it's shocking. Right. Mm -hmm. But any sort of social thing is going to have a bazillion unwritten rules. So it's not surprising but like to read like, well, you buy and sell who you want, but don't buy the people who you biologically made and free them. Like that's, that there's where the line is. Do what you want with these people's bodies, you know, don't feed them, you know, uh, be mad at them if they try to get some food somewhere else, because then like their shame and not like taking care of them. Well, it's just interesting where the shame lines were, I think is what the idea that I'm chasing. Right. Cause like the whole thing is like a shameful thing, but like, it's like weird where the shame lines were to me. It, yeah, I, it almost feels akin to if someone was having a conversation like about a farmer and saying like oh well you can have cows but you can't have a relationship with them like that's the thought process Mm -hmm. of being with a slave it's like this is your property you can't have children with your property you can't have a relationship using the term loosely because they are owned so you cannot have a relationship with them but you can't have a relationship with this thing because this is not a person so why are you having now we have offsprings who are also not people and now everybody has to know that this is something that happens it's like I found it really hard to reconcile or not reconcile that's not the right word but I found it really hard to go through portions of this with the wife or like concerning women because there was so much of this like excuses basically and almost like it for some part of it I almost felt like his wife looked at Harriet as an extension of her own sexuality Mm. like her relationship with her husband was an extension of her sexuality it's just so frustrating to see and it's like you said that where's the line here where's that shame line it's like nowhere if you don't see this person as a person you know it's just that's my property that's my truck that's my animal and then that's my slave you can't have a relationship with these inanimate objects yeah yeah Yeah. but then he was like in his language with her like i'm gonna make a lady out of you and it's like well i know you're not but like why like it's just like what is it the thing hmm. so one of the things that i i found myself thinking about but then i was like why are you even thinking about these people in that way but I'm curious it's just like what did it what did that feel like to them right right like so the doctor like what did it feel like in his body when he was like exerting this control over her and like what was he like did that feel like did it feel like what you feel like when you're on a roller coaster did he get a thrill like was he getting like like thrill chemicals like what did that feel like you know what I mean and what it feel like when the wife was like exercising whatever power she could over you know over Harriet and uh other people connected to her like what did that feel like and is it like is it like one of those sensations that you then chase right because like this dude was out 
of hand, you know, threatening her, threatening her children in these very, very cruel ways, you know, like what is it that makes that tolerable? Like, what is that that makes that something that one can do like over and over and over and over again? Question mark. And then it makes me think what that man did Ooh, I'm, I'm not gonna get in trouble. It's what Thomas Thomas Jefferson did. It's what a handful of our founding fathers did. Literally the same thing. So then it's like, if I have to reckon with how terrible this man is, I also have to reckon with the 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 horrors that our founding fathers burst into the world outside of you know writing cool documents and like inventing a country and all that. It is mind boggling. Um, the conversation between Harriet and her mistress in which um, her mistress is like, you're gonna sit down and you're gonna tell me everything about my husband and you, and you're gonna tell me it right now. And she, she pleads with the audience, like this woman cannot see that I have no choice in this situation, that I am an object in this situation. The, the wife's unwillingness to see things the way it, they are and to rather use them to justify her own selfish insecurities i was like that in itself is a whole new brand of crazy cuckoo evil but it's also like is that another service that she felt she was entitled to because yeah. you know I mean? like that's one of the things i think about sometimes when um you know when there's like a moment of reckoning or whatever and then like certain individuals you know, look for their nearest black person and expect that person to usher them through the underworld of like these new feelings, right? Like, and then it's like, is this, is this just like a service that you like that you're expecting? Because if it is, there should be like a cost sheet. Like, there should be no more free labor in this vein. But like emotional labor, you know, I think it's just like. I think that's a main, uh, a major thing that was happening, right? Or like you, one of the things that this made me think about is like, you know, like a lot of some, in some cases, like a man might be abusive to a woman, the woman then is abusive to the children, the children then are abusive to the pet, right? Because like mm -hmm. this thing happens. So like, yep. what does that look like when there are like owned people, right? Like, I think that that one of the jobs, like it's so nasty to say, is like a receptacle of that emotional abuse, right? Cause like, we know that people did that with physical abuse. We saw a story of that, right? With the guy who was like getting old and like beaten. Um, I can't remember the person's name. It was later yeah. in the book where we met that person who she saw again later. Um, but like, like, just the physical abuse for no reason except like to manifest that power yeah. you know and you know sometimes women are very good at doing like that sort of thing in the like emotional sphere and, which brings me to the other thing that this book made me think about a lot right so like in some um yeah, I, I'm fascinated by like how selective that people are. And I think that we are all like this in some cases with choosing the ideas that we think that we can hold in our heads at the same time, right? So like on one side, right? Like these um, enslaved people are treated as if they are just objects, but then like, you know that people understood that they had like this um, internal life, the way that like their children are wielded against them and like their ability to move is wielded against them. It's like, you can't on one side say or believe that this person doesn't have like a complex inner life if you're using um, their complex inner life to terrorize them, right? And so like there, there's always this um, thing, right? Or like a, another way that we would see it in this time and in the present is like, if you call somebody really stupid, I don't think you could call them shifty at the same time because these two ideas are at odds with each other, right? Like if you're gonna call somebody super scary, like maybe don't antagonize them at the same time because like these, these things can't exactly be true at the same time in the way that like, in the, in the way that like people pretend that they are. And I feel like we saw a lot of that 
in the, in here. Um, to clarify, are you saying like, like um, the relationship between um, Dr. Flint and Harriet, he was so willing to say that she was uh, stupid or a whore or all this, which can't be true because she has like, uh, she has emotional control of him to an extent and that she is using the situation that he put her in all the tools that he gave her, she's using in some way, shape, or form to make her life better. So she she can't be stupid because she's working with what she's got. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, in, in some ways. Okay. So with him, it's like, you know, you, you, you know, you don't understand, you know, you, like one of the things he said to her in a sense, it's like, you lack understanding, right? Like, you don't understand how good you have it. You don't understand what I've given to you. Mm -hmm. You don't understand, you don't understand, you don't understand. If she doesn't understand, then why are you trying to send her nonverbal cues that she's magically supposed to pick up, right? Like mm -hmm. if she's a person who cannot, who does not have the ability to like understand something complex, why then can she, why then are you expecting her to like understand your made up language, right? because it requires a lot, it requires a sophistication, right? To like try to pick up that. And she absolutely understood. And she was like pretending not to understand. And he knew yeah. she was doing that, right? But like in his head, he had to be like, you don't understand, right? In order for him to justify like what he was doing, I guess. But it's like in direct odds to like the day by day, right? Or like- I see what you're saying. You know, um, I feel like another good example of of like this kind of thinking, right? It's like, oh my goodness, if the if the Africans weren't enslaved, they'd totally be lazy, right? Um, but then like you've got people like working super hard to stay alive, uh, working super hard to like try to do anything. Like I will do all of the stuff that you're making me do, and then I'll stay up all night to like find a way to come up with some money to like buy myself out of the system, right? So like in the face of nothing but toil and hard work and ingenuity and planning and sacrifice and discipline, like the thing to say is like these people would have these people, you know, they're being benefited by this system because they can't do anything. Right. Or like they're, they're being, they benefit from the system because uh, they can't do anything except they're the ones who know how to like, who know exactly when the sugar has to be planted, which is a very specific time and a very specific way. Like these ideas are like really at odds with each other. Right. Or even like uh, for modern example, like, oh, these people are like lazy and stupid. Um, but they totally successfully manipulate like these ridiculous bureaucracies that like most people have trouble with. Like these two things can't, these are at odds, but like we, but we don't acknowledge that, right? I mean, I had to, I was trying to cancel something online yesterday and was like, oh my God. <sighs> I cannot even figure out how to do this. You know what I mean? And so like just the notion of somebody like deftly and naturally knowing how to like, you know, deal with a huge bureaucracy that's like in, in some ways like not built to handle the things it says that it does. It's like, these are at odds to me in ways that we don't acknowledge, I think. It feels like, um as the morality of slavery started to like come into question within, I guess, the American conscious, that's where you start to see that rise of like, well, we're doing this because these people are X, Y, and Z, which like you said, directly goes against what everybody's actually doing. I think if we're gonna talk about slavery, you have to talk about Thomas Jefferson. And one of his main things with not supporting um, abolishing slavery is like, well, Black people are dumb and violent. So if they don't have this, where are they going to go? What are they going to do? They're going to terrorize this nation. And then it's like, then why are these people running your house and your business and taking care of your kids and, 
you know, being why so are you, close to are you. you sleeping near yeah. the people? <laughs> if, if these people are that dangerous, why are they in your house willingly? Why, like, why are, are you buying these people to bring them into your house? You're making this you. choice. Yeah, it's just, and you still, it's interesting because you still see that type of excuse for this. I had recently watched a podcast, which I unfortunately cannot remember, watched a podcast. I listened to a podcast, mm -hmm. which I cannot remember the name of, but um, it took place at a um, civil war um, recreation in the South, which I don't want to play into that idea of like the South is bad and the North is good. But there you did see a lot of people who rectified that idea of slavery with like, well, slave owners are really nice or well, in like direct quote, she said like, well, black people have a servile mindset. So that's why they were there. It's just like, you st it's still such a prevalent idea that like people were owned, but they were owned because it was for their best interest. Never mind what they were doing before that, where they were perfectly fine, but it's like, well, now that we've disrupted them and brought them here, we can't just let everybody go. What are they going to do? They're not smart, but they can run my house and they can raise my children and they can cook me food and they can essentially run my business, but you know, they can't live. It's just so frustrating. And it frustrates me more knowing that there's still people who, if they don't think exactly like that, they think similarly or they hold similar values about current things. One oh. of the um, things that, um, I think that we talk about s slavery as if it were farther in the past than it is one. And then we also talk about it as if like, that was the thing that was the problem. And then it went away and everything like, and then there was like a fresh restart, which is obviously not true. But one of the things um, that I was thinking about, I was like, okay, when was this book written? You know, it was written in 1850 something. Uh, it was published in 1861 and written it between, I think, eight. 1855 and 1858 or 1853 and 1858 or something like that and then like I was like when so I looked around and I was like that was like your great grandparents were alive at the same time as this person you know and when you think about it that way it makes total sense right like why a lot of the um, thoughts and narratives are, uh, that justify these systems are so present, right? Because like your parents, 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 you know, whoever that it, like passed that to your grandparents, who passed it to your parents, who passed it to you. Like that is like, that's like a, that's a, that's barely a stretch, right? Yeah. Like when you look to see like where that was or like, um, the way I think about it a, a lot um, is like when we talk about like segregation as if it was like really far in the past when one, most people still live in segre segregated spaces, operate in segregated space. Many, 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 many people do. But, it's, but to me, I can never see that as very far in the past because my parents went to black schools and then like in middle school then went to what they called the white school right like that's like that is like 10 minutes ago and but but as you said Jacob like we want to like distance we want to be like oh my gosh whoo thank goodness it's like so far in the past right um but like if it's it, to use a gross metaphor but like if, if, you, if you ran it over in your car we're still leaving tracks on the road that's how recent that is but we don't think about it that way which is which is what it is I guess but I feel like it needs to be said because I still think we don't you know engage with it like properly in terms of like time what was a real kind of a, a, a wake-up call was I did the math and my grandpa would be my age in 1968 so I'm like whoa whoa that's a weird fact to think about. And I don't actually want to think about it. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's, it makes it too real. Um, 
which is so stupid because of course it's it's a, it's happening amongst us and i've already reckoned with you know the realities of racism i think sometimes as a white person i can trick myself and go I can trick myself and go, that was a long time ago. And then I see colorized photos and I think that my grandpa was the same age in 1968 as I am now. And I'm like, you got to keep yourself in check, Jacob, because. <sighs> um, What else stood out to you? What stood out to you in particular uh, when you're reading this that you were like, I hope that we dig into the following, even though it feels so gross to say that about this kind of book with that tone. Um, but like what, what were you hoping to discuss today? The grandmother. Okay, get into it. I, I just, I, it makes me think about when we were discussing um, The Hate You Give and there's that one scene where she goes to the prom and nothing happens like to put to push the plot along it's just like this she had a really good time at the prom and i'm like why did they include it and it's like because that sense of joy this is going back to something you had said earlier in this conversation that sense of joy can exist with amidst all of the um um institutionalized racism like even despite all the awful things that happened in her life it, it is an unfathomable blessing that Harriet had her grandmother um, and had that love and that foundation. Um, it made me thankful for all the love that I have in my life and uh, committed to being loving towards the people that I love as well. Uh, it, it, I just find it to be very moving, um, if nothing else. I think that one of the important roles of a character like that, like in a novel, um, but I think that here too, it's like, you know, when you have these narratives about like the dysfunctional black family, right? Uh, I think it's super important to illustrate like the, um, you know, the love that exists, right? Because like, you, and I think that we saw it a little bit in this, in this too, right? Because like um, when she was like, you know, considering her audience uh, and she's like, you know, uh, she's considering her audience and she's considering the judgment that she feels that she will receive for having left her child, right? Because like a, a true virtuous woman would like, it should be like the height of a domestic mother who's like all caring for her child, right? She's like, I could not do that, right? But she is showing, you know, one, she shows that like, she is willing to make the ultimate sacrifices for her children. And that's how she's loving her child. But she is showing this like, warm caring that would fit into the mold of what's more proper and i think that that's um i think that that's an important thing in a revolutionary act even uh, which is why like and when we talked about the hate you get, get give um it's part of why i like to talk so much about like the kinship structures and things like that because i do think it is like you know a revolutionary act to show that affection um, when a lot of popular images are just like, these people aren't really human. They don't do the human things that, you know, we do. Like, yep. they don't, like, love each other like we do, you know. Uh, I think that that's on the table. But the grandmother, she worked, she, I just, oh, I just wonder, like, how much stress she had when she was just trying so, she worked so hard to like make everybody okay and then like here's a little bit of a firecracker she's like yeah. mm -mm. and then like a lot of those other kids were too you know the brother was like from the get was like i cannot abide the system this brother the brother he probably saved his life right he he, he knew he was saving his life when he got out of there because he's like i am going to kill one of these people you know i i think those weren't his words but i think that was in his i think we see evidence of that in sure. his character right and he's like i gotta get out of here before they kill me right but like this grandmother i think that in real life it was like 1828 when she was able to like um gain her own freedom uh but she knew this world and this landscape very intimately and to watch her offspring 
like take the risks that they felt needed to be taken, you know, when she had created a situation of relative safety. I want to use all the finger quotes here. I think would have had to be like crushingly difficult. Maybe, or maybe that wasn't her personality. You know, I don't, you know, we don't know her. <laughs> you know, maybe that's all projection, but I cannot imagine. And to, to, to like, because I'm a worry wart, I cannot imagine other people are not worry warts. So I'm uh, like, even if I put my toe into into the grandmother's shoe for a second, I'm like, no, I would just crumble it and, and wilt and die. But I think some people just have the fortitude. And I think also she had everybody's ear in the community. Like she had the ability to like shame people, if even slave owners. Like her, if she said like, oh, you shouldn't have done that or, or whatever it might have been, that was also astounding to me. And what a giant responsibility is that? Uh, um, I speaking of like having people's ear, uh, the uh, doctor's reputation when we when we heard like one of the parts where I thought that she was funny was when she was like communicating to us that like people knew that he was up to no good, right? Like people were like that dude and his shenanigans. I would never help him um, because he is he is so terrible that even in a uh, even in a context where this is like accepted behavior. Mm, wouldn't want to help him. Like, what does that even mean? But also I just the way that she like communicated that just tickled me. I was like, like if I had a gossip buddy, I want it to be Harriet Jacobs because I feel <laughs> like she would get the good stuff and she would tell it to you in a way where you're like, I should not be participating in this, but I am absolutely going to. She was... <laughs> She was really good looking at that. I just want to look at my notes and see if there's anything else. Oh my gosh. I wrote complex knowledge systems. Because these folks, because Harry knew all the stuff, you know, um, but you have to. I mean, like, I, I think that, I think that from, again, like a modern point of view, it's like, awe-inspiring but that but if you're trying to survive then it's just it's not a question like you have to like know all of that stuff you don't get to just decide you don't get to decide not to you know or if you think about like the kind of stuff that like we don't know how to do because of um technology and like convenience stuff that like your grandma knew how to do like your grandma would be like all right this chicken is gonna be a bazillion meals yeah. right and they are all going to be delicious yep we're going to render this fat and i'm going to use this fat to do something like you, grandma knew how to do that because she needed to know how to do that right where like we would look at that and be like oh my gosh grandma turned that chicken into six meals and I, it was magic right um so i think the perspective is what it is one of the things that I was impressed with her for doing, cause she, you know, she was able to do a lot with this book, but she was like, um, she was, I, again, maybe I'm looking at this as a modern reader again, but like, she was like, yeah, yeah. I know you're going to talk to me about like Ireland and how those folks had it bad. Um, but I'm here to tell you that there is not a comparison. And she's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I know you're going to tell me that like there are poor people in England, but let me draw some parallels. She's like, no disrespect. Like their poverty is real. Yet these are not both apples, which I was mm -hmm. like, huh. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that in this, you know, mid 1800s narrative. And that reminds me of, of in the book where she's like talking to Dr. Flint and she's like, oh, I heard you were joining the church. And he was like, yeah, I, I definitely need to do that for my social status. And she was like, oh, did you read the book? Because <laughs> you don't act it. And I was like, oh, my God. She just like. And he got so mad. How dare you talk to me? Yes. How dare you <laughs> preach to me about, mm -hmm. about this Bible? Like, how 
dare you? Like that was again her being funny. Yeah. It's like I'm sure that happened. You know, <laughs> like she's like, really? This guy? Yeah. This guy. Um, but like the way she told us about it was like, you go, Harriet. And it makes you think like call out culture, right? Like call out culture is bad. And it's like Miss Harriet Jacobs said it's not bad. And I believe her. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So what, what closing thoughts? Oh, I, I'm going to ask my favorite question, which again, I feel like my tone does not match, but like, I like talking to you guys. Like my tone is for you and it's not for the topic. I'll say that. What did this make you want to learn more about if anything, or if that's the wrong exit on the highway, what are you going to clench your palate with if you need to get off of this road right now? I think for me, I guess it's kind of in that same vein. It just really made me want to dig more my, um, doing a lot of work with my family specifically. And just like, reading this and knowing is I've been able to go up to a certain point with one side of my family where I know the names at least of family members who were alive while she was like I would like to know more not only on that side but also on her side as well coming back down to like the present because like you said it's not that long ago there's these stories still carry it's just like as much as much as this challenges me, I like need to know more about that aspect of it. Like, it's one of those things where it's like, if nobody else is doing this, I have to, at least to like s tell ancestors, like, no, I know your name and I know where you lived on this census and that might be it, but I do know that. Like, that's kind of my thinking with this. Um, uh, I was just thinking about what Cheyenne said. Um, I, I, when I picked this up, I was like, it's the last serious book you're going to read for a while. And when I put it down, I was like, you're about to read some more serious books. Um, so I think I'm just, uh, sometimes I tell myself, oh, like, huh, you're woke. You, you know, a lot. You, you, and then I just need to constantly keep in mind that there's so much more for me to understand, even with what I perceive to be as a existing wealth of understanding. I'm like, no, you, you got to keep on learning. Um, so that's how I felt at the end of this book. Going into it, I was like, you need to read uh, like a fun little scary, like Halloween cute story. And then I finished the book and I was like, you need to read um, some more serious stuff about race. <laughs> This book made me want to read um, more about, I mean, like, I, I'm kind of not doing that much reading outside of like this list right now, just because of the way that, um, that things are set up. Uh, but I am coming up with one, one heck of a supplementary reading list. And there's this book that's about um, white women in slavery that I would like to, I would like to learn more about that because like the, just the dynamics with the wife and Harriet, it just made me think about, you know, what those, what those, it just made me want to learn more about, about that. And then, um, and then I uh, also am interested in learning a little bit more about, um, about the business end of slavery. Um, and I know that it varied, like I'm very interested in, um, I would like to learn a little bit more about like the sugar plantation versus the cotton versus rice versus tobacco. Like I'm very interested in like seeing like what's the same and what's different on, um, on those sides of things. And then finally, like, and I don't even know, but her like relative class and, and color privilege was interesting to me. And so I'm kind of interested in looking at some things from that perspective, right? Um, 
because her story was way different than another person's story would be and you can see it a lot in the book so for example when um when all her hair was shorn off it was like yeah like that was interesting to me because when i think about like color privilege i think about it as something um that like that black people are aware of and i'm not necessarily thinking about it as something that white people are aware of but like when he took her hair it showed me that he was very in tune to that like because his description of her hair was like her hair is naturally curly but it combs straight easily which is like very you know and like his own like I am used to um I'm used to hearing black people talk about like where like like where they feel that people fit in like a color hierarchy. That is a thing that like you hear um, in group, but that's not a thing that I've watched people like apply. And I'm, I'm kind of interested in, in what that looks like. You know, even though like we know that it was applied cause like, you know, like you have all these like categories like you know, octoroon, quadroon, blah, blah, blah. And that's like applying this same idea. But like, I feel like we saw it here in a way that was, um, that I wasn't expecting. I wasn't expecting to hear it like that or hear people described as a bright, a bright person, you know, like being described as like bright to mean like light skinned coming from a white person. I was surprised by that because I've only heard like that word used by black people to describe very light skinned people. And so I was just, that piqued the curiosity to me. And not to lengthen anybody's reading lists, but some of the things that you said reminded me of a book I just read called The Vanishing Half. I've heard about that book. Woo! The premise is there's like a city in 1950s Louisiana where everyone's super light skinned. And there's twins, and one of them decides to live as a white woman, and the other one decides not to. And that's the premise of the book. Like I said, I'm not trying to lengthen anybody's reading list, but it it was a good read. I'm gonna throw one thing in here that you reminded me of that stood out to me about this book, but like how when you escape into freedom, how you just gotta like cut ties, right? Like how the one brother was like, "You will, you guys won't see me again," right? Because like you can't, you can't. You know, like thinking about people passing into whiteness made me think about that because it's one place where people have to like just become like lose their families because you can't be social, you know, you can't, you can't be socializing, right? And just, I had never thought about like the escape in that way, right? Like to be like, all right, got to disappear now. All right. Speaking of disappearing. <laughs> I think that um I think that we've reached that that point in the conversation um that we're all gonna just disappear. What if everybody just like whoosh <laughs> just edited it, everybody's just laughing. Thank you guys so much for this conversation. Um I appreciate it. it was not like a uh, like thrilling fun topic but um but it's an important one and i'm glad that uh glad that you guys were willing to have that today <laughs>